Hello, in this video we're in the multiple linear regression setting and we're going to look at and derive the general linear hypothesis in the multi uh, multiple linear regression setting. As a reminder, our model is y is equal to x beta plus uh, epsilon and since we're going to develop a test we need distributional property so epsilon is multivariate normal with mean zero and variance covariance matrix sigma squared i. Now the general linear hypothesis is C times beta is equal to D. Now C is a matrix and of course B beta is uh, there's k plus one beta parameters here and D is some known constant. Alternative is that it is not equal to that. Um, where C is a known Q by K plus 1 matrix, right? It, it has to be such that we can multiply the, you know, these. The rank of C is, we're going to call it R, which it can equal Q, and, uh, or it could be less than Q, and Q, of course, is less than or equal to K plus 1. Now, the example that I, we're going to do for the rest of page 1 is taken from example 6.3.2 from Grable that was caught the book Grable which is copyrighted in 1976 and there they give a model with four predictor variables you know five beta parameters total you know and with some error and these are the tests that we want to conduct and then we're going to uh, de develop the C matrix that make these tests possible. So the first test we just want to know is beta 1 and beta 2 equal. That's it. In test 2 we want to know is beta 1 and beta 2 equal and beta 3 and beta 4 equal. Test 3 we not only want to know are beta 1 and beta 2 equal we want to know do they equal 6. Uh, beta, the test 4 are all the beta parameters 0 or not and test five is we just want to know is beta one, beta two, beta three, and beta four equal. We, we're not postulating what they equal, but are they equal? In uh, test six, there's two constraints, beta one minus beta, you know, minus two times beta two equal to four times beta three. You know, is this, does this relationship hold and the keyword and does beta 1 plus 2 times beta 2 equals 6 so we will develop the C matrix for these um, in test 1 the C matrix is this and the D vector is the 0 0 and beta of course is the beta 1 through beta 4 this will always be the same in every test it's this so notice if you take this times this vector you get um, beta 1 minus beta 2 and that's equal to 0 the D so if beta 1 minus beta 2 is 0 that and you you know you subtract that over it says hey are they equal so this is the test that we would conduct for the second test we need two constraints. You know, this one is, is isolating beta 1 and beta 2, which is this piece. We're saying they're 0, so that means just, hey, are they equal? Here we're isolating beta 3 and 4, and, you know, and, and is the difference 0, meaning are they equal? Now for uh, the third test, we're, we're this. You know, we want to know are they equal and are they 6? So here, when we multiply this first row times the beta, we get beta 1, Is that, and then D is 6, so it's beta 1, 6, and then here, it's beta 2, we isolate beta 2, and is it 6? So we're testing this. Now the fourth hypothesis, you know, are they all 0 or not? And so the C, the C is the identity matrix, right? That first... Uh, row column one it you know corresponds to beta zero and is it zero and then of course it goes down now here 
for five, I actually, well, I, I say I, but it's the, the example in Gravel's book. They, they provide two possibilities for testing this, and their point in showing that is that to test the same hypothesis, the, the seed that is used to test it is not unique. It, we could actually have two different seeds that test the same set of hypotheses. And so, for example, here, the D matrix is zero in each case. And so here it's beta 1 and beta 2 are equal. Beta 1 and beta 3 are equal. Beta 1 and beta 4 are equal. But we could have equally done it like this. This is saying that beta 1 and beta 2 are equal. Here this is saying beta 1 plus beta 2 is equal to minus beta 3. And then, but because of this constraint, it says, you know, hey, th are they equal, you know? And then this constraint, you know, is just, you know, along with the previous two, it all, you know, you, these two C matrices are the same for testing this situation. For the test six, we just set up the constraints and That's it. So now let's jump right into the theory of why this test works. So we're testing about C times beta. So a good point estimate might be C times beta hat. So we're going to use that as a point estimate for C times beta. Remember C is a matrix, beta is a vector. So I probably should have that little vector symbol there. Um, so let's look at the expected value of C beta hat, you know, where beta hat, of course, is the least squares estimate for beta. C is a, a known constant, so it comes out front. Expected least squares estimate, of course, are unbiased. Well, then this becomes an unbiased estimate for what we want to show. And boy, I'm good at forgetting that vector symbol there today. Let's look at the variance of C times beta hat. In, in the variance, it, the operator comes out front and it's transposed out back, so we get this. The variance of beta hat is uh, sigma squared x transpose x inverse, and this is, we le learned that in the previous video. Now, if we look at C times beta hat, you know, we have C, and this piece right here is the least squares estimate for beta hat. And if we just think of this as a, ma a matrix times y, then it's clearly linear in the y's, which then says C beta hat is multivariate normal with this mean, right? It's unbiased. And this variance covariance structure. Now, if we subtract the mean from this estimate, then this becomes multivariate normal with a mean vector of zero, and this, of course the variance covariance structure still stays the same. Now, we need to study this piece a little more before we jump right into the theory of, of how this all works. So let's examine the variance covariance structure. Now this constant sigma squared, I just take the square root and pre and post multiply it. So when that comes out front, we get this back. And I do that just so because in my mind it makes it easier, and you'll see why in a second. Now, notice that the x transpose x inverse is full rank. I mean, we can take an inverse, so it has to be. And in multivariate, uh, in multiple linear regression, we assume that we have full column rank, so this becomes full column rank, and we can take the inverse of it. So, because it's full column rank. We, we can create a matrix, call it R to the one-half. It, it exists such that this uh, full rank matrix can be thought of as this product of R, R to the one-half, R to the one-half. Now, I have a video called the square root matrix that describes this situation. And so these can be created, and they're symmetric. Both of those are symmetric. So then A, which is this, can be thought of and written in this form, right? If we take the transpose in, you know, the R is 
front and then a C transpose and the X comes out front and X to the one or R to the one half R to the one half was this so this does reproduce this and now if we think of A written in this form then the rank of A which is this is actually just the rank of one of those that's a well-known property about rank but R is full you know rank it's full column rank it's a square matrix so the rank of this is actually just the rank of C which we said was R that's the way that we began this video the rank of R C now A is symmetric right because when, when oh that should be a transpose there why didn't I see that so when you take this transpose and then distribute it in you get it back so it is symmetric and now this next part I almost skipped it and you'll see why in a second now because A is symmetric a generalized inverse of A exists and I have a video called generalized inverse matrices and we only need what's called a one inverse for this for this uh, video um, now if C is full row rank then the generalized inverse of A becomes A inverse then that A is invertible right if this becomes full row rank then this becomes a an R by R matrix that is full rank so you can take the inverse but if it's not full rank then we have to have the generalized inverse um, and because A is symmetric then the generalized inverse is symmetric and this so I almost start created this video assuming that C always starts out with full row rank but that's not the case so that's why I'm bringing in this generalized inverse matrix now note that A inverse and the, and the, it's, it's a generalized inverse A times A inverse A and now because it's a generalized inverse this is A it can be replaced with A so we get it back so that says A inverse A is idempotent and now we're I'm going through these properties because they're needed in the next theorem now the trace of this idempotent matrix because it's idempotent it actually equals the rank and then uh, the rank of this is actually the rank of a which we said was R so um, right because the, this is the rank of A and we said it was R okay so the, the quick little proof of this if we have the rank of A that's actually equal to the rank of A A inverse A because it's a generalized inverse which then this becomes less than or equal to the rank of this, you know, it's the product of two matrices, which then becomes the uh, uh, less the rank the less than or equal to the rank of A. But we said A was R, so this rank is greater than A, but it's also less than A or equal to A, so it has to equal the rank of A. So the the trace of this is R and that well we'll just keep going here so notice that if C is full row rank the meaning A has an inverse then it's this which this is clearly item potent now if it's not full rank then this property holds right because A generalized inverse of A A this is A and we get this back okay and those two properties are needed for this next theorem so if we look at this here see remember uh, this piece here was multivariate normal with mean vector zero and uh, variance covariance matrix a you know and and so if we look at this vector times the generalized inverse of A, this vector, that is K 
chi-squared with r degrees of freedom. And it instantly follows, if you look at theorems 2 or 4, so the distribution of quadratic forms, it's theorem 2 if c is full row rank, and that becomes a inverse, and it's, and it's 4 if c is not full rank, and then it's generalized inverse of a. And it follows exactly from these properties that we just reviewed. So now the test statistic becomes this. So we said um, oh that's interesting. So this isn't quite accurate. So the A inverse has sigma squared in it. So I don't need to rewrite sigma squared here. So this is chi-squared with r degrees of freedom. So we're taking a chi-squared, dividing it by its degrees of freedom. And then this, um, the sum of squares residual divided by sigma squared is actually chi-squared. And it has degrees of freedom n minus k plus 1. So this is a chi-squared divided by its degrees of freedom. Then this simplifies to this. Okay. So the R is clearly there. The sum of squares residual divided by n minus k plus 1 is an unbiased estimate for the sigma squared. We'll call it S squared. Um, under the null hypothesis, of course, you know, this is C times beta, but under the null we're saying it's D. So that's why there's a D there. So this comes down. Now A actually has sigma squared in it. And so if we rewrite it out, it becomes this, you know, uh, with sigma squared. But then those sigma squareds cancel, and we're left with just whatever's left over. And this is an F distribution. Now, the, on, the last thing we need to do is make sure that the numerator and denominator are independent. So where are the random variables here? So it's beta hat and sum of squares residual. Those are the random variables. And beta hat can be written like this. Um, sum of squares uh, re residual over n minus k plus 1, or this unbiased estimate for s squared, is this. And so I have a video called, uh, you know, Independence of Quadratic Forms, or something like that, that says if we, mo if we take this times this, and it's 0, then they're independent. So this times this is zero and, and instantly we know why because um, I minus H is a perpendicular projection matrix onto the orthogonal complement of the column space of X so when, when you pre by multiply by X transpose times this you get zero because this matrix project, projects everything on the orthogonal complement space of X but since this is in the column space of X has to project it to the zero vector and, that, and that's what it is. And so that, that proves that they're independent. Well, that's all I have for this video. I think the next several videos, we're going to re-derive everything that we've done so far in R. So we're going to use the built-in command LM, which is linear models. And we're also just going to use matrix multiplication and re-derive all the output from the LM command. We're going to drive confidence intervals, and we're going to drive the estimates, and I think it will be helpful just to show what all that output means. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. I sure did. Please like the video and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Thanks. Bye.